Imagine a stainless steel container, no larger than a soda can, filled with plutonium-238 oxide. This material can generate enough energy to propel a spacecraft to the outer reaches of the solar system. But how can something so small hold so much power? To find out, we go to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory to discover the fascinating process of producing plutonium-238, the fuel that takes humanity to the stars. The story of plutonium begins in 1941, when Glenn Seaborg and his team at the University of California, Berkeley, discovered this synthetic element by bombarding uranium-238 with neutrons in a cyclotron. Shortly after, during the Second World War, the Manhattan Project used the fissile isotope plutonium-239 to develop the Fat Man bomb, detonated over Nagasaki on August 9, 1945. This explosion released an energy equivalent to 21 kilotons of TNT, as if an entire city had exploded in an instant, marking a before and after in human history. Thanks to its ability to sustain chain reactions, plutonium-239 became a key element during the Cold War, with facilities like Hanford producing tons of this material. But our focus is on a different isotope, plutonium-238. Unlike 239, it is useless for weapons because it releases a large amount of heat and alpha radiation, making it unsuitable for explosive fission. However, these same characteristics make it the perfect energy source for space exploration. In the 1950s, NASA discovered that plutonium-238's decay generates constant heat for decades, ideal for missions in the darker regions of the solar system, where sunlight is not enough, such as the orbits of Jupiter or Saturn. In 1961, the first radioisotope thermoelectric generator using plutonium-238 powered the Transit 4 satellite. Since then, iconic missions like Apollo 11, Voyager 1 and 2, Cassini and the Curiosity rover have relied on this element to operate in the darkness of deep space. A typical generator with only 4.8 kilograms of plutonium-238 can produce about 110 watts of electricity enough to keep scientific instruments running for 15 years or more, like a small engine that never stops. But how is this material, which sustains our planet's space exploration, actually made? Production begins with neptunium-237, an actinide derived from nuclear reactor waste, the same type of waste that in the 1940s and 50s fueled the production of plutonium-239 for weapons. This material arrives at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee as a 30% nitric acid solution, with a dark green color like a concentrated spinach juice. The first step is to transform this solution into a solid. In a sealed chamber, the solution is pumped through a stainless steel rotary kiln two meters long, inside a glove box with lead walls five centimeters thick to protect workers from alpha and beta radiation. Operating at 800 degrees Celsius, the kiln evaporates the acid in a controlled process lasting about six hours, leaving a fine neptunium oxide powder with a sandy texture and a slight metallic sheen, similar to the sand on a volcanic beach. This powder is mixed with aluminum powder in a precise ratio of 80% neptunium oxide to 20% aluminum, which acts as a binder to facilitate pressing. The mixture is transferred to an automatic pellet press a high-tech machine that works with the precision of a chef shaping perfect cookies. Before pressing, the mold, made from hardened steel, is cleaned with automated brushes and lubricated with a graphite-based compound to prevent the powder from sticking. The powder is poured into a titanium funnel and a ram applies a pressure of 2,000 kilograms per square centimeter, forming cylinders 2.5 centimeters long and one centimeter in diameter, each weighing seven grams. These pellets must be uniform to withstand the extreme conditions of irradiation, with a standard as strict as assembling components in a Swiss watch. Each pellet undergoes thorough quality control in a sealed chamber. Four precision lasers measure the diameter in two different points with a tolerance of five microns, while a vacuum device equipped with optical sensors verifies the length. Atomic emission spectrometers analyze the chemical composition to detect impurities such as carbon, iron or magnesium, which could alter the nuclear reaction. Approved pellets are placed on a transfer device called a boat, 
a stainless steel tray that carries them to the next stage, like a train transporting valuable cargo to its destination. A single boat contains enough material for one target to be irradiated. The pellets are inserted into aerospace-grade aluminum tubes, 30 cm long and 2 cm in diameter, sealed hermetically by laser welding to withstand temperatures of up to 1000 degrees Celsius and extreme pressures. Each of these tubes, known as targets, holds between 20 and 30 pellets, stacked with great precision by robots that use smart cameras to avoid errors. Then, at the High Flux Isotope Reactor in Oak Ridge, these tubes are exposed to an intense stream of neutrons for several days. This exposure transforms part of the original material, Neptunium-237, into Plutonium-238. The result? Each tube produces about 4 grams of plutonium oxide, which is the material used as an energy source. However, this process is not clean. It also generates radioactive waste such as cesium-137 and strontium-90, the same isotopes that once made it extremely difficult to purify plutonium-239 for the first nuclear bombs in the 1940s. The facilities are protected by reinforced concrete walls 1.5 meters thick, designed to withstand magnitude, seven earthquakes or direct impacts, like a bunker guarding a treasure. Radiation, temperature, and pressure sensors monitor the reactor core in real time, with automatic systems that can shut down the reaction in less than one second if an anomaly is detected. During irradiation, the neptunium emits a dark green glow, while the resulting plutonium-238 shows purple or magenta tones, visible through leaded glass windows. This change in colour is a visual sign that the process is advancing correctly. After irradiation, the targets are intensely radioactive, with gamma radiation levels of up to 1,000 rads per hour and are moved to hot cells, shielded enclosures with lead glass 1.2 meters thick and liquid mineral oil as a barrier against neutrons, like a strainer separating unwanted ingredients in a recipe. Robotic arms, controlled by hydraulic systems with millimeter precision, cut the aluminum ends off the targets using automated diamond saws. Between 20 and 30 targets are placed in a stainless steel tank known as a dissolver, equipped with corrosion-resistant piping. The chemical process begins by dissolving the aluminum with 10% sodium hydroxide, a procedure that takes four hours and leaves the neptunium and plutonium oxides intact. Then, concentrated nitric acid is applied to dissolve the actinides, separating them from the fission products. The solution passes through ion exchange resin columns which selectively trap plutonium-238 with 95% efficiency, while the neptunium and wastes such as iodine-131 are discarded, like a coffee filter that retains the grounds but lets the liquid pass through. The plutonium precipitates as a bright purple powder with a radioactivity of 17 curies per gram and is washed with oxalic acid solutions to remove trace impurities. The plutonium oxide is pressed once again into pellets with 90% purity and baked at 1,400 degrees Celsius for eight hours in sealed furnaces with an inert atmosphere to increase its density. These pellets, one centimeter in diameter, are encapsulated in stainless steel containers designed to withstand extreme heat and radiation for decades. A container with 150 grams of plutonium-238 generates 84 watts of thermal power enough to power the systems of a spacecraft like the Perseverance rover for one year. Before these containers can be used, they undergo a series of rigorous tests in specialized laboratories. They are scanned with X-rays capable of detecting tiny cracks smaller than a human hair. Then, high precision scales verify their weight with a margin of error of only half a milligram. They are also subjected to vibration tests that simulate the forces of a space launch and chemical analyses are performed to ensure that the material's purity exceeds 99.9%. Once they pass these tests, the containers are stored securely in reinforced concrete vaults at Oak Ridge. There, special ventilation systems with HEPA filters capture any radioactive particles. From that location, they are transported to the Los Alamos National Laboratory where they are finally integrated into radioisotope thermoelectric generators, known as RTGs. Veach RTG contains 4.8 kilograms of plutonium-238 and can generate enough energy 
to keep a spacecraft operational for more than 15 years. This achievement stands in sharp contrast to the Cold War days, when as much as 60 tonnes of plutonium-239 were produced annually for military use. Today, that same technology has been transformed to serve space exploration and other peaceful purposes, showing the positive turn nuclear science has taken. Why is plutonium-238 so important? The answer is its reliability. Unlike fossil fuels or solar panels, plutonium-238 provides constant energy, even in places where it is extremely cold or where sunlight never reaches. It can operate in extreme conditions, such as the minus 150 degrees Celsius of space or the hostile atmosphere of Mars, powering cameras and scientific instruments for many years. In addition, its production reuses existing nuclear materials, generating very little radioactive waste, especially compared to the plutonium once used for making weapons. Safety is a priority throughout the entire process. The laboratories that handle it, such as Oak Ridge, are equipped with advanced systems that prevent any leaks or accidents. Since the 1960s, more than 25 space missions have used this type of energy without incident, thanks to highly resistant containers that protect the material. But its usefulness is not limited to space. It has also been used to power scientific stations in extreme locations on Earth, such as Antarctica or the ocean floor. The current challenge is that it is produced in small quantities and with new missions on the horizon, such as those planned to explore the moons of Jupiter or Uranus. It will be necessary to increase production, requiring coordination between scientists, engineers and governments. And that is how plutonium is produced. Tell me, what did you think of the process? I will read you in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, click the like button and do not forget to subscribe to the channel. In the screens you will see next, there are more videos that may catch your attention. Feel free to watch one. See you next time.